It has been teased for weeks, but the new version of Cascader is finally here. And I know most of you are interested about the new AI animation generation tool, rightfully so. But there are also other features that will make it easier for new users to get into the software. We will cover those later. For now, let's start with the in-betweening tool. This tool promises that you only need to set up the key poses of your animation and it will fill in the rest. Let's put it to the test. First, let's start with a simple movement from point A to point B. This is similar to what we saw in the demo and it works beautifully. The AI generate kind of smooth transition, their acceleration, deceleration, and even at subtle motion like weight shift and tumbling. And if you decrease the time between two keyframes, the movement speeds up, and if you increase the time, it will slow down, just like it should. For locomotion, this is insanely good. But okay, we already saw it in the demos that it does it really well, now let's see how far we can push it. How does it handle maybe a punch or a kick? Well, it kind of works, but it, it's not really. Uh, how about walking on hands in a handstand pose? Yeah, that... Um, what? <laughs> Maybe a backflip? Yeah, that's not quite what I was expecting. <laughs> okay, at this point I reached out to the Cascader team and they confirmed that the AI was mainly trained on motion capture data of locomotion animations. Actually, there was a post by the co-founder of Cascader on LinkedIn where there's a short sneak peek how they recorded it. So it's expected that these more acrobatic animations won't work. One thing I think this tool could be really useful in its current form form is for blending between animations and filling the space and time between them. So I gave myself a little challenge. In one hour I want to combine different Mixamo animation into an obstacle course. So I arranged the animations to form roughly a circular path so it can loop. Then I place different obstacles and edit collisions to them and use the in-betweening tool to bridge the gaps between the animations. One useful tip if you want to use it for a similar use case is you can track the motion path of the center of mass before and after the generated frames. This makes it easier to see if you need to adjust the timing between the two animations to have, the, have a similar spacing. Of course, one hour isn't much time, so the final result won't win any awards, it's not clean in any way. But let's take a look at it while I share my final thoughts on this feature. Overall, I love it, it's really impressive, and I really like the idea of generating animations based on poses rather than text-based AI animation like most tools use. I feel like it gives you more creative control. However, in its current form, it's quite limited. I'd love to see it handle maybe some attack animations and parkour vaults in the future, although I understand that it's a difficult challenge, but I trust the Cascadar dev team, they have never disappointed us. I know generative AI tools are often controversial, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on this tool. Uh, let me know in the comments. And let's move forward to collisions. Previously you could only use cubes and capsules as colliders and now Cascador allows you to add kinematic and convex mesh colliders meaning you can use any kind of 3D models for collisions not just for ragdolls but also for auto physics. Okay let's see an example I added a chair to the scene and under comments collision there is a new kinematic mesh collider option. If collider visibility is enabled you will notice that the mesh appears kind of triangulated and you will also see a new collision material and kinematic mesh collision behavior in the object properties. I made a quick animation where the chair tips over as Kaski shifts his weight forward and when I enable the auto physics it will automatically recognize the feet as fulcrum points with the chair. You will also notice that there is a new visualization for fulcrum points. There are these kind of tracers that indicate whether the feet is contacting with the object or with the ground. And this 
is quite nice. And at the end of the animation, I added some generated working. In addition to the kinematic colliders, there's also a convex mesh collider, though currently the developers recommend using the kinematic one. So I haven't tested the convex option much, but one limitation of the kinematic collider is that it only detects uh, collision on the surface of the objects. Maybe you can run into issues where the character goes through the mesh. In that case, you can try switching to the convex mesh collider. And these new collision objects are also great for ragdolls. You can now add complex environmental objects and I was surprised but the performance is quite good even with high resolution meshes and you can interact with the environment easily. The other update for ragdolls is that now you have better interaction between characters when they are contacting each other. If you want the characters to keep in contact during the ragdoll simulation, there is this new constant constrained touch point settings and if you enable it then the characters will keep their contacts during the simulation. One important note to add here is that if you created your scene in an older version you will need to go to file and click the fix scene and for rigs it's also recommended that you regenerate your older rigs by entering rigging mode and generating the rig again. It seems like with every update the auto-posing gets improved and this is the case this time too. So you might have encountered this issue that you have a pose set without auto-posing, maybe with mocap or box controller or point controller modes. And when you later try to activate the auto-posing controllers, the pose will break because the other controllers weren't activated. Now when you activate a point by moving them there will be a pop-up that will ask if you want to automatically activate the necessary controllers to maintain the original pose. If you prefer the old behavior you can still let the auto posing reset the poses before or if you don't like this pop-up you can check to don't show it again. And there is also a new shortcut Alt Shift Z will let you lock or unlock controllers across the selected interval. Additionally, the way the pelvis and the thoracic spine behavior has been refined. Recently, I was creating a walk cycle while I'm relearning animation, and it was quite difficult to get a natural hip and chest tilt. And you might have noticed that when you right click something in the viewport, now you are not setting the pivot mode, but a context menu appears. The options in the menu depend on the type of the object you click. For example, you can activate or lock points, view their trajectory and other options. If you still want to set the pivot point without the context menu, you can and hold down ALT when you right click. Or if you prefer the previous behavior, you can go to the input settings and maybe make the context menu appear at ALT right click and for right click the pivot setting. There were changes to the importing options as well. First of all, there is now GLTF and GLB file formats supported. And this means that in addition to FBX, DAE and USD, there is one more option. So it's always welcomed. I use GLB files exported from Blender for both the chair in the previous demo and for the environment. And they work flawlessly. Just, just make sure that you have the correct unit set things in the GLB file. And a major improvement, if you have files with multiple animations, you can now choose which one you want to import. Previously, it was always the first animation in the file. So you get this pop-up with the list of the animations and you can select the one you need. And some of the import and export settings for FBX files were hidden in the scene settings menu. Now they are also located here in the dialog, which is more convenient. There are also a few new commands. We've already talked about the collision commands, but one of the most important, I think, is the new transform options. Now when you're creating a new rig, joints will get a node 3D option and you can 
can save the default pose in this. If you are using another scene, don't forget to click the fix scene as mentioned before and you will get this behavior added to your objects. And this means that you can set and reset the character's default pose. Previously it was possible only using box controllers, but now it works with joints as well. And I think this is a fantastic update because it allows you to move joints freely even if they don't have box controllers attached to them and you don't need to worry about losing the original pose. For example, palm bones typically don't have box controllers, but you might want to adjust them to get a more natural looking hand pose. And now you can just move it and if you mess it up or you want to reset it, you can do it at any time. There is also one new command where you can create a camera that matches your current viewport and this makes setting up your scene much faster if you need a camera. And there is also a new script for exporting to Roblox and with that there are two new sample models for Roblox as well. Maybe this is just a big deal for me, but I really appreciate that the Python console and the Node editor can now be docked in the UI. Previously switching between the main UI and the console was a bit of a hassle, especially if you have only one screen. So I really appreciate this one. And on a related note, you can now import and export your UI layouts. Saving a specific layout was already possible, but now you can export it and share it with someone. Another great quality of life improvement is that you now can get tooltips for commands and various settings when you hover over them. For example, you no longer need to open the documentation just to understand what the additional restore option means in the secondary motion settings. And if you have your own commands, you can add tooltips to them as well. You just simply need to define a function with the name command description with an underscore and this function should return the string that is displayed as the tooltip. If you are interested in developing commands, I have a short playlist on the topic, you can find it somewhere here. As always, there are even more improvements that I haven't covered in this video. You can check out the full list in the release notes. Personally, while I think the in-betweening tool is really impressive and it's really great for marketing. I feel like the smaller quality of life improvements will have a bigger impact for me at least. But I'm interested to hear what you think, what's your favorite addition in this update. I'll see you in the next one.